Cheers to the podcast. Cheers. We're First live, episode, boys. we're all together. Mm-hmm. Well, welcome, guys. We're going to do something a little bit different this time. We're going to kind of film what is going to be a mix between a podcast. We're going to answer some questions that we've gotten that have come in and that we kind of have for each other. But the first thing we'll do is kind of do a season recap and uh, talk about each phase we had throughout the season, each trip we did, and go over some some things and actually show some unreleased footage, um, some stuff that we didn't include in videos because we probably shouldn't, but we're going to. So I guess to start out, how was your guys' like start in October, your first couple weeks of October, that early season? How did you guys, what was the hunting endeavors? Mine was low. I had a, had a son in April, so I didn't get out hunting much they get a lot of scouting done. Um, I do mostly public, but lost our property that we had in the years past, and so I didn't. I didn't do a whole lot of hunting in October. Right. I did more sitting, filming, filming for you. Yep. Um, sat with my dad a couple times in the state lands. We saw a few deer, but it was a uh, it was a pretty slow and uneventful October. Because we, I think the first time we got out was like October seventh. Yeah. We, we sat that morning. We went up north opening day and we were in Traverse City catching small That's right, yeah. October first. So we didn't we didn't end up going hunting until second weekend. Yeah, that second weekend. Yeah. And so we but the beginning of October is typically slow for me anyways. I don't especially in the mornings. Yeah. I don't see a whole lot and mm-hmm. so I we were we were still on the fishing ground at that point. But we did I had well first I had an encounter with the target buck I was after that big 10 point and my dad was actually sitting you know 150 yards from me and that deer came out initially walks through and skirted me at like 28 yards where I couldn't get a shot at him and then you and I tried to position for that deer I think it was the week after you know we did the hanging yeah. hunt and that was my first saddle experience like first ever and we set up for that buck and he came into the food plot and I got the trail camera notifications and so we were expecting him to come through and he just, he never did. But we did have a couple, I had a couple encounters with that deer in the first half of October. So I saw a bunch of, a bunch of bucks uh, early October. It just, they were relating to food. There wasn't really any, any chasing going on and whatnot, but it was active. It was just, I really only hunted in the afternoons too uh, it just seemed like the afternoon movement was way better but yeah how about over on on the east side, east side yeah it was slow i in october i really um focused on filming this is my first year like solely focused on filming mm-hmm. about a whole setup um and then so i've been saddle hunting for three years this is my fourth year and then implementing filming with like the challenge of saddle hunting is so much more yeah, than I, I thought. Um, so really in October, I wanted to focus on like getting filming down and focusing on that. And I had tagged out last year for the first time. And so, uh, you know, I'm like, this is my off year. I'll focus more on filming. I'll film my brother, film my dad. And then we started getting bigger and bigger bucks on trail camera. Yeah. And then it's just hard not to go out you know every day you can um but the beginning of october was super slow a lot of the nocturnal deer um but then we had a big 10 um uh we had a target buck sticker show up he was in a a nice 11 point um and then nice maybe like three or four more shooter bucks show up on camera throughout the um, early part of october and then towards the tail end of october i was going every day I could, whether it was filming with my brother or my dad, or going out myself. Um, did you have any of those shooters daylight before you did? Or? So we had two of them daylight. Was that um, and that was kind of by the house? Or was so that, that was, there was a chunk um, by the house, they started daylighting more frequently yep. earlier than the second, we have a second chunk um, that we hunt. Um, but that land is like surrounded by ag and the deer kind of use that as like their bedding ground and so they'll come usually right after dark they'll all funnel into that property and bed down 
um, and then right before daylight they'll um, bed down or get out of the beds I should say and mm -hmm. so uh, that was like a more challenging piece to hunt rather than the pinch point that we hunt closer to our house um, and so as soon as we got into November it was like you know you know full force ahead full steam ahead I was grinding it out I probably put like 200 hours in the first like three weeks we went to Ohio hunted Ooh. hard seemed like we might have missed a little bit of the rut here um, yeah. but then we got back things really started to heat up and uh, yeah I just grinded till the gears fell off pretty much yeah I think uh, as October rolled on it, it seemed weird because it seemed like it got warmer though towards Halloween and stuff and then once Halloween hit that was when we left for Ohio and it was like the first cold front here too yeah we missed the best hunting in Michigan we did down in Ohio we had I know these guys had bucks yep. daylight and big deer um, we have a little permission piece, what's that, 25 acres? Yeah, yeah. And uh, we had some good deer showing up there in October, first year hunting it. And so we we waited till we got back from Ohio to go in there, wait till the wind got right, because it's pretty much all bedding. And we had a lot of, lot of deer pictures in October, and surprisingly less through November. Yeah. And so that was, that was a piece that this year, like I said, first time hunting it, I think next year we'll probably hunt that more of that mid-October, mm -hmm. early October time frame because that's when most of the deer were in there. And we had had some had some nice bucks on that. No doubt. Yeah, that one that one deer that's either an eleven or twelve. I never got a really clean picture of him. I mean, that's a one forty, like yeah. mid one forty, maybe more. And he was daylighting in there. It's, it's right tight it. to bedding. It's a it's a tough piece to hunt. But it's, we thought let's stay out of there until yeah. the rut and it'll get hot. You know, it'll be hot nose in that bedding area. and then, But I think next year we yeah. hang a camera even earlier you know, and probably just try to get in there first couple of weeks of October mm -hmm. and leave some of this stuff here alone that gets better towards the end of October. Right. I think so too. But yeah, then because the, the tail end of October wasn't the greatest. I remember we sat another morning when it was like really red and we thought we were only going to get 30 minutes of, yeah, of big, daylight. Yeah, big rain prop was coming in. Because it was the same wind I got a daylight picture of the tent right in the corner. And so I was like, Dill, we have to go. We might only get 30, 40 minutes and then we could, you know, pop into the cabin or something. And we ended up getting like an hour and a half of daylight and it was perfect, calm. It was all like no deer. It was like red skies, there were rainbows because it was kind of drizzling a little bit. But uh, yeah, what if we only saw like two deer that morning. Yeah, I think we saw a couple by the cabin. So it seemed like it slowed down a bit towards the tail end of October and then we missed it with heading to Ohio after that cold front. But Ohio was Ohio was fun, man. Ohio was fun. That was that was a week hard of hunting every day. Yeah. And up the hills. Us Michigan boys are not used to that elevation. <laughs> that was Jack. My dad Jack. My dad being fifty his size, he was not mm -hmm. uh, he was not thriving towards the end but yeah. that was that was fun we saw i saw every deer i saw deer every six yeah. i think i think giuseppe got the raw end of ohio yeah ohio, ohio, ohio did, ate dude. him up and spit him out oh man. as he was getting giant pictures from back home which yeah i think adds more <laughs> pain hurt. but oh. ohio was a blast i saw nothing that i wanted to shoot jake did but that was that was fun yeah, it, I was, it was just a different kind of honey. It was the wind was almost like impossible to predict. Dude, yeah, it came. I think at least me and Dylan got blowed at like almost multiple times each set. Yeah, yeah. Besides, was, like the two sets, I didn't see anything, and it didn't really matter where the it, wind came from. It did not did, matter because all the ridges be, and valleys. And it was. I was down there last year, so I went to Ohio last year. My dad had been there two years in a row now. And so we kind of knew what to expect a little bit more. And mm. I was telling these guys, yeah. like, it's thick, it's tough hunting. And we actually saw a lot more deer than I thought we were going to, but I I don't have a deer. I, I don't understand what they do. It's tough. My last sit, I, there was a big cliff face. I finally got to the spot where I heard a bunch of grunting and had deer almost every time I sat come from or go to that direction. You know? And it was a sweet spot. I thought this 300 foot cliff almost that was straight up and down yeah, i never saw right. a deer would come down it and i was sitting for 10 minutes and the deer hoofed right down like a billy goat <laughs> just and I, was, down the face, I, I don't know what those deer do down there 
it's wild yeah no it was it was so fun because like i told you guys before that trip like I, we, i've been out of state hunting and stuff but it always seemed like it was just a long weekend and then this one was a full like six days of hunting so it was it was so fun to experience that and and you were sick at the beginning yeah, of the hard. trip i was and then, no that was the end right well, no, i got sick went, at the end you went down there sick I went down, yeah, that's right. You went, went down there not feeling great. I went down there sick, and it hit me the worst on Thursday, yeah. Friday morning. Yeah, yeah, that sucked, but what are you going to do? He has a year-and-a-half-year-old, right? Was... Yeah, you know, I got a year-and-a-half-year-old daughter, and that was the first experience I had being away from her for more than, like, two days, and it it, uh, it definitely wore on me towards the end of the week, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. I was a little blubber on, I think, my last intro. I... I teared up a bit because I was like, you know, I'm excited for two reasons. We could have some late magic happen, but also that that was our last hunt because I was I was ready to be home. To, I think all of our last yeah. interviews that day. I know we were exhausted. I like too. I got to the tree. I forgot a couple things. I forgot my fluid head so to <laughs> film right, anything. Dude. I was trying to film it by hand. I almost dropped my camera. <laughs> I was pissed. I was in and a you bad. Got your phone, didn't you? Yeah. 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 I was in a bad mood, <laughs> and I think. I don't think that interview made the video because I was, I was pissy. <laughs> Mind of me. I was tired. I was sore. It was 70 degrees and yeah, the end, beginning oh, of God. November down there. Saw, I think I saw nine, seven does that yep. last, that last sit. Me too. And not a single buck was falling them when they were chasing all week. Mm -hmm. And I know I was tired and just over it. Yeah. No, it was, it definitely was tiring, but it was crazy how it, switch so quick like thursday when it started heating up and friday when it kept getting warm it just completely flipped because the first shooter i saw was when and i talked about it in the video a little bit it was and you guys know it was when i was hanging my sticks i was maybe 200 yards from the truck and i didn't bring my bow with me because it was middle of the day i was just hanging a set for that night and i got two pegs into the tree and i heard a crunch and I looked over and at 40 yards, it was like 150 inch 10 point. I was, was just like, here. oh my God. And so then I just crouched and, and uh, stayed right there. He had no idea that I was there either. Walked to 30 yards across the creek, stood there for a bit, went up the ridge, raked the tree, came back down to that same spot. I could have shot him twice if I had my bow with me, which hurts so bad. I wouldn't have gotten on film, but I would have got everything else and I would have been just fine if I didn't get it on film that way. But um, he was a stud and I never saw him again after that because he just, uh, he left and I had high hopes. And then that night I had that eight come in and he was chasing the doe all over and um, you know, he chased her right by me at like 28 yards and I probably should have hollered a little bit more than just the grunt I did. It was, uh, it was one of those scenarios. He was on full. It happened so fast speed. and I, I wasn't. I wasn't feeling, I guess, as sharp as I should have been. And that wasn't the buck that we went down there for. No, either. it was 115, 120 inch eight point yeah. that they said we could shoot, but I also knew he wasn't the 130 minimum right. that we had called. So I'm not too upset, but he did turn out that that could have been a shooter. Uh, I would have been happy to have my hands on for that sure. deer. And then I never saw that 10 again, but um, there was like no chasing after the next day um, in Ohio. but. It was fun because your dad shot that one tumor phase buck. Yep. Ended up doing that the second to last day. Because didn't we, you saw it first, right? Or did he? He did. He saw, he it, saw it. He saw it two times, yeah. He saw it. And then I think, did, did we get a trail camera picture? We sent that to the property owners. Yeah. That's right. And so then they were like, if you guys are willing to use a tag on that deer, do it. And that was that second to last night. And Jack had a good chance and shot him. and. Uh, that deer went what 50 60 yards yeah it was a it looked real cordon away in the video it wasn't that bad because the camera was you yeah. had a double ladder stand all the way to the left my dad was all the way to the right shot it it was it was a great shot it was perfect shot yeah. it was a crossbow and uh i was i was nice to get a deer down yeah it felt good because we are rewarding been, after so long we've Terrible. been to ohio like i said i've been to ohio twice but that's been down there three times and that was the first buck that we've killed we've shot does down there before but we had a lot of time money and sweat invested in there so huh. to get one down even if it was a hundred inch 
two and a half year old. Yeah. I was I was happy. Well, and it, it was doing that deer justice so too because he was already fully blind in that one eye, and when you look that stuff up, it those tumors expand like crazy. Yeah, they don't. He if he made it through the winter, it'd be surprising. Yeah, I can't remember the name of what that Fri fibroma or yeah, something. Like that. Yeah, I I yeah, I remember I looked at an article of it, but that deer would have been blind probably that winter and would have had you know such a worse deal, but. The recovery was fun, and uh, there wasn't much blood. Time out, you know, had a blue nose. Okay, but yeah, that the blood trail was just small spots that you were finding, and your dad was too. There was a couple of trees that had some good blood on it, but it really wasn't good. And then um, the yeah. funny part about the whole yeah. tracking situation was that uh, Jack stand is probably five hundred, maybe six hundred yards, like up and down a bunch of hills, real rugged terrain. And so we were gonna take the side-by-side -side over there, or the, the ATV actually. Mm -hmm. And so we had four guys <laughs> on this ATV. Just bobbing We had up Dylan. On the Foreman 400 from like 97. That's a Dylan group. and Jake were on the back. I was in the front with my spotlight kind of acting as like the headlight because I was blocking it. Jack was driving and we get up to uh, this creek, maybe 80 yards from Jack's stand. And I hop off it, and I'm just like looking around with my my uh, spotlight, and Jack's buck was actually maybe 15 yards from the trail, yep. belly up, which would have ruined the whole tracking part of the video. So we had to uh, we got to we had to follow the blood trail. And and I wanted to know. see what the blood trail was. Like. I wanted to see what it looked like too. And uh, thank God we found the deer before we started looking for yeah, the blood. Yeah, because that we would back out. Yeah, that blood was tough. We probably would have backed out, but yeah, thankfully. The angle of it was, he was up in a 20 foot ladder stand, you know, and then it was straight downhill to the pile where the deer came in at. And so that deer was probably 40 feet below. Like it was- Yeah, I mean, it was down that slow angle. And he hit it perfectly like to where it was just high enough, almost under the spine and it exited like bottom side of that. Yeah. opposite leg it stuck into the opposite leg perfectly so it was a great shot yeah but that made it you know not bleed as yeah. much even though the entry hole was four inches wide the rage that, did that rage went nuts on it it was just so high up on the deer yeah never really blood yeah. the whole it lot. makes you wonder because like i've had blood trails like that where it's super spotty and yeah it's super tough to find and it that one without an exit hole and being so high, yeah, it was, it was a tough trail. It really was. You, know, you, you if you weren't there, I don't know how much we would have picked up on it. I mean, you and you and G were picking all those little specks out like crazy, and I'm like trying to film it. And I'm like, <laughs> we're supposed to film this little <laughs> diamond little speck. That was fun. So yeah, we got him, and. Uh, and then was it the next morning that you shot? The him? next morning. So we, <laughs> <laughs> so it was, was it Friday morning? Yeah, Friday morning. Yeah, Friday, Friday morning, morning. It was yeah. our last day. And I'd been skunked. I got skunked the night before. Yeah. Um, and so I was just, you know, a little bloodthirsty at that point. Wanted to get a deer on the ground. We've been grinding for like five days straight. I'm exhausted. We're all exhausted. Jake got me sick. So I'm feeling <laughs> like shit. You got the plague. And um, and I was gonna go back to this uh, stand um, that I'd seen all of these other deer in, a lot of does, a lot of does with fawns. I've never seen in Ohio the first week of November so many does paired with fawns. And I think we'd all kind of right. attest to it that almost I would say like eighty percent of the time a doe would walk in, at least one fawn was with her. For sure. They were starting to kick them off. They were starting to kick them off. I got some of film of them kicking them off. Yep, they were starting to kick um, them off. But it was unreal. So I went back to the same stand at the very edge of the property. I had like 15 yards to the property line. Mm -hmm. So not ideal if the deer ran. Um, and this doe kept circling me. This is maybe like 15 minutes before light. I'm just watching her with my binox in the dark. And she knows exactly where I am because they always do. And I'm in this ladder stand, maybe like 25 feet up in the air, way too high, um, right in front of a bait pile. And she want, you can tell she wants to go into the bait pile. Okay. So this doe comes in to the bait pile. I draw back the sec second she gets hits the bait pile and she's facing me. 
and then she flipped, does a 180 facing away from me, never broadside once. And this fawn is kind of like blocking her vitals when she is broadside. And then uh, she finally turns like according to me a bit. And I'm drawn back at this point for like two and a half minutes. Yeah, you were, I think it was three minutes we were at full draw yeah. for three or four. And, and I'm know. like, well, maybe I could just, you know, put my bow back down and then I'll draw back again when she gets broadside. Right. And the second that I start trying to let my bow out, um, my arrow kind of wiggles, makes a noise. She looks up at me, starts stomping. And I told the boys if a deer blew yeah, at we me, had a pact. if a doe blows at you while you're, you know, within range, then, you know, She's brown is down. Go. She blows, you go. It's kind of she blows, you yeah, go. so <laughs> I had to take a shot that wasn't broadside. Uh, right, but it was still a quarter two. It was lethal quarter and two lethal. Well yeah, yeah, inside. definitely. And I've taken the shot before. It's mm -hmm. definitely not like my favorite shot to take on on whitetail. I, I think I've taken it twice so far. Yep. And I've killed both animals within you know thirty yards. They have barely ran. Right. Um, but this doe ended up being. I thought she was at twenty yards. Had my twenty yard pin, like inside between her shoulder blade and her brisket. And really with the stand, how high the stand was, and the bait pile was actually like 15 yards away from me, almost 13 from the start of it. When I shot, it hits her right in the throat. <laughs> like that white patch <laughs> under oh, her yeah. chin. And I was shooting the Grim Reaper. So that thing, I mean, first of all, my broadhead embedded in her spine, she drops, um, which is actually perfect because the property line's right there. We'd have to get permission from that landowner to recover the deer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just followed up with a second shot within, you know, 10 seconds and then uh, dragged, her, dragged her underneath that stand and finished out my morning, but. Deer down. Poor thing. Poor thing, right? Poor thing <laughs> is right, yeah. But, but she tastes great. We. We uh, quartered her out that morning. Um, the, well, yeah. the thing is, is like, even though you know it wasn't your intention to go shoot a doe in the throat, there's this not is there there is no way you can make a more lethal shot because you you guys when you gutted her and everything, it went perfectly through her throat and was just lodged right in her spine. Oh, yeah. Right through yeah, the so She was dead. It's right in the throat. You couldn't center it anyways. Like so, it was, it was it worked. I wanted to use the footage, but I also wasn't sure if people would get the wrong idea like that was intentional, so I didn't. Definitely but not intentional. Once you never want to like purposely try to spine the deer. Yeah. Definitely not in the throw. Like a headshot, none it of worked. that is it worked. I mean, it's kosher. Yeah, and it was I know for me, first time hunting out of a saddle, first year, filming all that stuff. I had one hunt where I had deer all over me. I had a buck chase a doe right underneath me. I was all jacked up. I had a doe coming to the pile, and our goal going down there was to shoot a buck and a doe. Because yep. if you shoot a doe, you got into a drawing for a free hunt at the same outfit that you were yep. at. And so we were all trying to shoot does, but we didn't want to shoot them too early because they were rutting. It was a big thing, and I got probably the biggest case of doe fever that you could call it. <laughs> I had this doe that was blowing at me. She finally comes into the pile. I draw back, go to put the pin on it and get settled, 20 yard chip shot, shot that I've made many times. Mm -hmm. As soon as I saw her in my sight, I pulled the trigger. Didn't even, <laughs> it was <laughs> one of the worst shots ever. Missed her right over her back. Yeah. It was one of those things where, I guess, doe fever. I, I was so excited, so jacked up from the hunt. We had so many expectations that I am glad it wasn't a big buck because that was probably the worst bow shot I've ever made in my life. <laughs> yeah, the whole that that was such a tough dilemma because, like you said, when we showed up, it was we bought a buck tag and we bought a doe tag. So the goal was to get one of each, but it was when was the right time because I had so many sits where I had does right in front of me, but I wasn't sure what to expect for bucks to be on their tail or like, okay, this is perfect. I got a decoy right in front of me. They're going to be chasing so. I wasn't eager to pull the trigger early and then I regretted it by, you know, Thursday, Friday. And then when it hit Friday night and I had a doe at 15 yards, I was like, 
do I want to deal with this tonight, yeah. the day before we head back? Tired, had to pack up, we were leaving early the next morning. Yeah, probably not, because then you got to go across state lines with them fully deboned and everything like that. So it's like, hmm. So I didn't, but yeah, I kind of regret that. I should have shot those on like Tuesday when I had them right in on me. But, but it was hard because they were chasing. Yeah. At the beginning of the week, deer were chasing yeah. all the way up until Thursday morning, yep. and then it just shut off. And I never had a mature doe come out by herself right to the bio. Like they said, they had fawns with them. They had little bucks with them. I had other deer around me. I could hear stuff around me because it's so thick there. You can hear way more than you can see. Right. And so I was always like, I don't want to ruin it. Yeah. But it was it was a fun trip. I think I think it was it was a highlight of my hunting season. It was Ohio. Yeah. I had the most fun. Sat the most. I saw a ton of deer. You know, it was it was worth it. And then, you know, once we got back, you know, that next week and weekend was, was my birthday. And so I got to have, you know, a couple good sits there. And I, you know, I saw some young bucks and I had a couple bucks actually fight at like 20 yards on my birthday. And that was pretty cool. Well, it was actually the day before my birthday because it rained on uh, November 8th. And that, you know, it actually kind of, that there was chasing going on, but it seemed like our shooters were held elsewhere. You know, I didn't didn't really see any shooters at that point. I had one, uh, one tall, nice eight, and he actually looks just like that buck. I mean, identical. And that's what I pictured as soon as I saw him. I I was like, I I see that buck right there, and knowing that that deer is probably you know a younger buck two and a half maybe three and a half it was just like i don't know how much to press it and um, i didn't i didn't shoot that buck i didn't really have a shot but i could have probably grunted or tried something more to get him in um but then i just it was like right before rifle season when it was i had a couple bow hunts left i started getting really frustrated i was i was like getting pissed off because you know, the last three years, I put in a bunch of time in the stand. Dill's put in a bunch of time with me. G, when you're around, put with me. And I haven't shot a buck since that deer we shot, um, that, that really nice eight point. And I was starting to get pissed because then I, you know, I was seeing five, maybe six deer and I'd see does and the bucks I would see were just feeding. And it's November 10th. I was just kind of blown away. So the end of my bow season, I was, I was pretty frustrated um to say the least but i don't know how hunting for you guys when you got back well i got i was sick at the i got sick on our very last two days you know and then was sick all the next week but like we mentioned earlier i was getting pictures of giant deer moving in daylight the entire week while we were in ohio so i ended up not even taking a break like literally the day the day after we got back, I was in the stand every single day. I took a bunch of PTO for the month of November. I think I worked like five days that month. And the one day that I switched, my brother uh, was letting me decide if I wanted to sit the property at the house or the other property. I chose the other property, let him sit at the house. And he actually shot, and it was like, the weather in November and December and October in yeah, Michigan, dude, we can all agree, like terrible. probably it's the so worst warm. fall weather we've ever seen. Warm, windy, rainy. rainy. I think it's rained almost every day in December. November had days like in the 60s yep. and it was windy most of the month, but it was like 57 degrees, windy as hell, like 20, 22 mile an hour gusts. Just, yep. I mean, you're blown over in the tree. Let my brother hunt at the house. That night he shot that nice eight um, that we have a video out on. Um, and then the week prior, while we were in Ohio, my dad actually shot an eight out of the exact same stand. That's right. That was daylighting. Yeah, that. Um, and so I was just full bore into it. We had one shooter left, Sticker, he was still alive. Um, and he was daylighting or coming out right after daylight, um, coming into that pinch point at the property by our house. 
And so I hunted him insanely hard. Uh, my neighbors would got so invested in it as well. They'd ask me, text me with updates, you know, see how I was doing, you know, if I got anything because I'm there every morning, every night um, for about like three weeks straight. And then I think it was the third week of November. I think, yeah. Yeah, it was the 22nd. 20, yeah, so right before Thanksgiving, yep. um, my days of hunting were limited. Um, besides Thanksgiving, I had to work coming up and then I had a Costa vacation Rica. plan. I had to go to Costa Rica. <laughs> um, and so I only had a couple more days left to get this deer on the ground. And I had seen him like three times in person in the stand um, the week before, just chasing does. I mean, the area was so hot. And then uh, one of my other buddies that hunts maybe like five or 600 yards down the wood line um, ends up shooting them at like 4.45. Um, so that, you know, ended the chase for stickers. But um, after that, there was one eight point that I had on. I got to film him a couple times. He's like a 110, 120 deer. A nice buck, especially for that area. Um, so I sat out for him pretty much the rest of November, or the rest of the days that I could, that I was home, that I wasn't working, and really didn't see anything. So it like right. totally shut off like that. It's funny how a property can be so hot during like one or two weeks of the rut yeah. and then completely shut off. And the, the problem that I found that I had is that, I don't know if you guys had ever, uh, you know, saw this or seen this in the past, but we had so many smaller bucks that we've been passing on that they've actually like in there when they're running because usually they start running a little earlier they chase out the does and it seemed like the does were no longer bedding that spot because those we had like a spike we had a, a four point we had a three point and we had a small seven point that almost every sit in october the late part of october and november we would see maybe two of those four bucks every single set just cruising around and I had two of two times they were chasing does but um literally in November I think we might have had like four pictures of does on our trail cameras yeah it's either that or maybe those bigger bucks had those does locked down just not on your trunk or something too so those little bucks are like where the hell did our ladies go and yeah yeah after so rifle michigan starts november 15th you yeah. it was hot it was a pretty poor rifle season you yeah. for i think everybody at least that i know of we saw a lot of deer but it's been it's been a season of small bucks and those you yeah. know and 100%. a lot of like we've talked about bad weather getting the time to sit in the stand just this little deer yeah it's pretty much how i can explain after coming back from ohio is does and small bucks and that's about it yeah and now and then once december hit it was like i still haven't felt tagged this year you know it was like now i'm gonna go get some medicine in the freezer my wife's bugging me we've got two roasts and a back strap left like we need some venison and uh that's been the goal so the rest of this season is basically that i haven't did the weather's been tough to i could be sitting in tree sand i guess but it's been so rainy like tonight's rain and snow yeah. right what it's doing right now and i don't necessarily want to get rained on no. in there Not and for Adele. there's in in trail cameras i just haven't had a lot of shoes around so i did shoot a doe uh two right nights ago is it Friday night? Yeah, Friday night. Friday night, I shot a doe. Was and that your first one this season? Yeah, that was my first deer. So it, I just kind of, it was 4.30 and I planned to hunt that night. And it was just, uh, you know, I'm just going to go out and walk this tree line. And if there's a doe out there, I'll shoot her. So I ended up crawling up the tree line and I saw some does in the field and got to a good position. And it was like 212 yards and I shot her and dropped her. And it was a nice big doe. And then it was just a, kind of an endeavor after that to get her recovered because I tried to drive out into the field. My truck got stuck, got that out. Dill and I went back later and, and took a different route and 
thankfully he was there because we had to drag her about 250 yards so we didn't get stuck and um, get her out of there. So that's the first deer I've killed. And, you know, that's why tonight we're going out to shoot some does too, hopefully. And, you know, just try and put some venison in the freezer. But it makes me excited for next year because of how many nice eights we passed out here this year. And some I was, I've still been getting trail camera pictures of that are going to be really nice. And I, I don't know what happened to some of those shooters. Like you're eight, maybe he didn't get shot. Imagine that deer next year. Really? Yeah, it's my outlook for next year. Is, so we lost the property that we've had permission for for like oh, 15 right. years that was sold this year. So beginning of next year, they're going to turn it into some kind of park, which sucks. Yeah. Um, and then our and the other chunk that we hunt, um, it's like 80 acres, 80 to 100 acres. Um, it could it has really good potential, but the neighbors, um, it just really is so important to have good neighbors that you're on the same page with. Um, these particular neighbors will shoot whatever they see, whenever they see it. Um, they, there's like a little bit of hunter harassment, I feel like going on. Um, they just like, they'll see our truck you know, parked out in the field. They know we're hunting. They'll fire a couple pop shots into their woods. Um, and so, you know, we've had them on our property a couple times, tracking deer or just walking around, trespassing. Um, they, one of them had our trail cameras. We, you know, went to the door before, you know, escalating it and he just gave it back. And just a couple instances like that. Um, well, so make <laughs> make that property so tough to hunt that I really don't want to invest too much time into it and then have you know the neighbors screw it up so I think next year um, I have to look more into getting uh, permission for a couple more pieces of property down there mm -hmm. just so I can put in the time and effort because I love doing that right. um, and that's like you see the fruits of your labor come to fruition when you do put like a big buck on the ground or even a doe, uh, but just see everything work out perfectly the way you had planned. Yep. So that's my uh, starting point. So preseason starts in uh, March <laughs> when I ask uh, all these farmers for permission to hunt. Well, pretty yeah. much, but for yeah. me, I got, uh, November's my busy season for work, which is unfortunate. November, December, I'm typically traveling every week for work. That's not a holiday. And so I, my season's pretty much October, you know, and so I think I think next year we're probably gonna do a little bit more pushing to get out there more in October mm -hmm. and hunt a few different properties a little a little harder, change up the tactics a little bit just because this is the first year that I felt like I was not had the time to hunt with yeah. a kid, with the work, with all the holidays, with being sick. It was it was a tough year. It's so a lot. I think that yeah, you were you guys were just in a sick drought in November, dude. Yeah, I was whole household of the Todd family. Yeah, daycare <laughs> had us had us down bad. Yeah, and so I think next year I would like to try to fill more tags in October. Not sit on my hands and wait for the rut as much because of the property that we used to have. That was a great rut property, so you could just kind of sit and right. wait it out and know that you're going to be seeing deer but we don't have the property anymore and so I thought I was going to have a little bit more time and see more deer and I just did it so we I think I think next year October I will be hitting the harder and then try to fill more here in November yeah and I think you know in, in Dylan and I have been trying to get some new permission pieces or, or leases because this property is like you know, you have certain winds that work for it and certain ones that just wreck it. So having just one piece to hunt on, you know, like this, this chunk here is pretty good on a south wind. You know, we, we hunt like a south wind, a southeast, that seems to be pretty good. Um, north, west was all right for the one spot we sat, but like, you know, there's not a lot of good winds for out here. So getting our options, widen will be will be a huge thing too but um 
yeah, I think we definitely need to push October afternoons a bit more next year. So, and I think we'll probably if I go on an out of state hunt, because that's I like the out of state hunts more because I don't have a lot of land. Right. And so we're talking about possibly doing a later season one next year, like a like a December, which I think would be exciting. Not miss the run up here because we all missed yeah the main part of our run up here this year, and. Oh, it'd be fun to have something to look forward to in December since we can't ice fish in Michigan anymore. Yeah, yeah no doubt. That was supposed to be our next thing we'd be doing, and and January doesn't really look like we're going to get ice. No, and I, boat. Yeah, just going to have to get the boat out, I guess. But um, one of the questions, because I, I know I want to touch on this too, and get, especially Dill, you've had a couple years in the saddle. And this was my first year in a saddle, Dill's first year in a saddle. I mean, overall, what are, what are your thoughts, both of you, I guess, but especially Dill, because this is your first season. What, what are your thoughts of the saddle overall? I love the saddle. Yeah. I love the comfiness. I love how light it is. I like how you can get in a tree. It's a lot harder to film out of the saddle than it is on a hang-on. It is more cumbersome with the ropes, with the tether line, with your bow with your camera and for my whole life I'm so used to setting a stand a certain direction where I think the deer are coming from and it's completely backwards with the saddle yeah and so there was many times in Ohio where I'd set my platform I'd set up and I'd have so many deer on my weak side I have so many deer straight behind me I'd have deer underneath me like it was it was a learning curve for sure I yeah I found it a lot more tough to film out of the saddle and self him out of the saddle. To film for you out of my saddle oh, is way yeah. easier. No, if I if I could only sit in a saddle when I film people from here on out, that's the only way I'd want to film. But yeah. like you said, self filming is it's a it's a task, man. I, I or I, or we just haven't figured out the right system for it because I think you gave us some light on that you mount your your. Uh, your base. Uh, camera arm, whatever, your base and stuff, you know, kind of between you and the tree, a little bit offset. Yeah. So you, well, I'm a lefty, so it's you guys offset left side. And then running it to where it's like you have your camera right across you and then you're drawing your bow right next to it. Type yep. thing. And then when I first looked at, you know, watched some videos of people saddle hunting and self filming and stuff, a lot of them will do it on the back side of the tree and film the opposite side so they get the camera on it. And then they'll just have a really wide view, scoop to the other side and shoot, you know, opposite. But to me, I just don't like that because I can't see for sure if the right. deer's in frame. And if for some reason they don't come through that window and you have an adjustment, you're missing the shot. So I like having it right there, but it made it difficult. Like when I shot that shot at that doe in Ohio, my something on my bow hit my camera. Yeah, shot. I did. That's it right. Shook the camera. And so it was, it's definitely a learning curve. It is, but I, I mean, the comfort of the saddle unmatched. I, oh yeah, that's the comfort of the saddle is unbelievable. You don't get any of that. And the mobility, I think like for me, yeah. you could go and almost, you could set up in almost any yeah. tree. I mean, I've set up in trees that I could like fit my two hands around and you know, it's a little sketchy yeah. because I'm, you know, I haven't been in the gym so much this year. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, like you could go anywhere. You literally bring in your climbing sticks. Now, it, just saddle hunting in general, like it's it's amazing. Like you could, I could do like 20 mile hikes and then, you know, set my saddle up if I wanted to. Then with camera gear, it's a little different because like that's a whole nother. I got my camera arm. I got my camera. I got my mic. I got my fluid head, batteries, my GoPro. So that just all adds on to it, um, which makes it a little more, you know, uh, difficult. But right. I, you know, I fell in love with the saddle four years ago, and then I finally got you guys to it's expensive invest start. in it. It's an expensive start, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't go back. It pays off, though. And, and I knew how much you guys <coughs> move, move yeah. around spots. Um, especially you, Dale. So I, I knew it'd be perfect for you. That's um, probably like 
a catch-22 for you guys down in Ohio, especially, I mean, even me, it's so easy to adjust and move that it's so you don't sit the same spot twice. You pull it down, you're like 40 yards you. over, yeah. you go 40 yards over, and it's it's way more mobile. I, I'll never go back to a hang-on. Oh. The thought of carrying a climber, imagine carrying your summit around no. now. Like, I, I was so excited when I got my climber back in early college, late high school, yep. and loved doing that. And then we got the Helam hang-ons, and I thought that was great. And then I went to the saddle and realized how much easier it really is. Yeah, 100%. I think comfort level, it does, it's not even a comparison of that, that how much more comfortable the saddle is. The versatility, like you said, about being able to set up in different scenarios. I did set up in a really small tree and I probably won't do it again. <laughs> but it was also like, I think if the tree was dying, it was really dry and super light. So that wasn't good either, but no, I think the, the versatility of it too, and what I think, Dill for sure, you and I both need to get better at. I don't know, I, I haven't sat with you in a saddle as much, but like, you can shoot 360. You know, I, I see the way you can. Just some of those spots are, I don't know, I have to figure <laughs> out how to get more stable with it, I guess, because when you're completely on the edge of your platform, flex out you know on the side your your rope kind of can want to swing you and it's just going to take some more getting used to but yeah, your form has to be great shooting out of a saddle it does the first thing i did was i got up in the saddle and i had my dad to take a target from like 20 to 50 yards and just go all the way around the tree and you, you got to hit your anchor points and you got to go through your process to shoot good out of a saddle because if you get some of those awkward positions where you got the Tether across your chest and you're around the tree on one foot and mm -hmm. trying to shoot like you mess. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's a lot easier to drop your arm yeah. versus you know tilting your whole body with it. But yeah, I did the same thing when I first set up in it. I shot a few shots and it did take that thinking about you know not just dropping my arm and pivoting the whole upper half. But I think overall the saddle is. It's lethal, man. I'm, I'm so excited for using that going forward because I feel like as soon as I really get a big buck pattern, it didn't happen this year that I had a good pattern on our top shooter, but when that happens, that's going to be a game changer for it, you know, and uh, whatnot. But I guess the, the big difficulty and something that I want to ask you on too is the filming aspect with it because it's it's tough it's so nice when you're filming for somebody else in the saddle if you're you know linked two up but when you're self filming man it it does it is a challenge there's no doubt it is and i know for for me this is not my first year filming but my probably the most serious i've ever taken yeah. filming for sure and so i'm not great at it to begin with <laughs> and then to do it out of the saddle was there's some Ohio footage that looks like crap. <laughs> <laughs> Where you just zoom in, you're panicking, I'm slapping the bear zoom around and just trying to not move, but still get the deer on camera. But for me, I never had the opportunity this year, but I'll shoot the deer before I film it for sure. Mm -hmm. and yeah, deer comes first. I will, uh, I mess it up a lot of times. I got busted a lot because I move a lot more in my saddle. It's so much easier, it's so to, easier. To, you, to move your whole body instead of move your head or you know, this, that, and the other. And so it was it was fun to learn it. it for some reason, make hunting more complicated than <laughs> it needs to be, but just add a little more difficulty. Uh, yep. But it's it's been a blast. Yeah, it really, really has. And it's harder, like, just in general, like, yeah, I could see it. I could see this giant buck through this brush with my binox, but then I gotta, you know, to make it a video, I gotta try to get it on camera, and then I'm focusing on twigs like 30 yards in front of it. <laughs> I can't get my camera arm wrapped around the tree. I got my saddle in the yep. way, and then you end up like at one point, I was like, I know that deer is in a spot where I'll take 30 minutes to get my camera even on it if I can. So why try and then I just wait for it to try to get into a lane and if it doesn't then I don't get on film and 
and then I'm just talking about it and people can, you know, yep. make Trust. their assumptions. <laughs> but I feel like, you know, I got into a couple of those scenarios this year too. And in Ohio, I did the same thing. There was a couple where I was like, it was a spot. I just couldn't film, you know, and it just wouldn't work out. But I did it a couple times here is I would just like, I could tell, okay, the deer was in this brush, but I wouldn't try to zoom in on that exact thing. I'd just leave it kind of wide. And when I, you know, went back and looked at it, I could see the deer in it. So that's what I would do for it. But I think B and G's biggest mistake that we've got a lot better at was we like to zoom in where you can see the heartbeat and see it blink for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's so tempting to zoom all the way in so you can see it so good on that little camera. And then the second one. Jake throws it on the computer and it's the deer is the whole size of the screen and it looks cool. terrible. Yeah. And so we got a lot better at that and when in doubt, zoom out, you know, kind of helps. Now you guys got, you guys, as soon as it was like, we pulled it up on the TV once you had it down. It was like, it's so much yeah. fun to see on the screen. It is dude. It <laughs> like, is. Yeah. That was a, that was a learning curve for it too. If you see us, by the way, if you see us keep glancing out here, it is late doe season and my rifle's sitting right there. And, uh, yeah, we've got a field right here. So if, if a doe decides to peek her head out, we're going to, we're going to shoot one. But well, right. so the, I got a miss. Oh, okay. So yeah. So time the, out. I need a refill too. There was only I need a refill the two. Well. That was two. Got of refills. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh, you got all of my phone. Well, let me grab the paper towels. I guess. Time out. <laughs> so. I guess the next thing to, that I want to get all of our input on would be just talking about the Michigan's DNR and how our tag system works, how the buck to doe ratio looks, just all the regulations on it, how you guys see it in your hunting, what you think should change. Um, I know we've talked about it a bunch outside of this too, but um, I guess to just shed some light on it. What do you guys think should be done? <laughs> uh what's kind of going wrong yeah so and how does it affect i guess the hunting i guess the the hot topics for the dnr managing the herd in michigan are uh, being a two buck state you know and baiting are probably yeah the, the two hot topics because <laughs> i just ripped that ass dude I'm sorry it smells so bad Dude, he was ripping ass all last night too. Oh, I'm. This is staying in the video. We're just gonna just keep rolling. <laughs> um, oh my uh, bad, man. The uh, Michigan baiting used to be legal, in Michigan. Yeah. I remember I was. I grew up, and my dad and my grandpa baited. I know. You guys baited. Yeah, we just baited carrots and it was beets. The nice part about it was, doe hunting. Yep. And getting inventory of the deer you had on the property. Yep. I don't think I or anybody I know of has shot a big buck off a big pile. No, not that I've never seen besides at night, like night saying, time, to get some inventory. Yeah. I've never seen a big buck daylight on a bait pile. But yeah, I think that's so valid. I see a lot more deer with bait pile in front of me. Yeah. Day hunting a lot more fun. Yeah. And then what is the difference you could say like what is the difference between hunting over a, a bait pile rather than like a cut cornfield with corn spilled? It's literally like a, you know, you might have like a, a 200 foot section that's just filled with corn kernels. Yeah. Spilled. Like what's a di like, tell me there's a difference. Oh, this is a great property for example. You have corn, you have beans sometimes, you have alfalfa, alfalfa, and then two or three different food pots. Yeah, two, you yeah. And you hunt the food plots, you hunt the fields. You guys don't hunt the woods here. Not a whole lot, no. no it's the, heavy. It, it, they they yeah, bed in there, you, you stay out of it, and yeah. you, have, you, have, you hunt the ag fields, you hunt the food plots, mm -hmm. and you guys used to have bait out here, and like I said, you, you get pictures of deer, you know it was out here. Right. I, I think you should be able to bait. We were down in Ohio, they could bait. It was fun to it makes filming a lot easier because <laughs> you can film the deer so much quicker. Yep. I will say it is fun hunting not over a bay pile because the deer are a lot less twitchy. Yep. Like they're, if you see them out in the fields and everything, they they move a lot. A little bit more relaxed. Yeah. And you can, you can get thing. away with more movement right. away from a bay pile. Yep. But I think 
they're, the hunters are declining in Michigan. People are seeing less deer. I think an easy way to fix that is to let people bait. Yep. And I don't know. If, I'm not a scientist. I don't know about CO, CWD and how it actually affected everything. But I know I had more fun hunting over bait. Yeah, and, the, and like what you were saying earlier, though, the CWD problem, I don't know all the ins and outs. Maybe I just don't have enough of the education on what the difference of doing bait. Like, I know it's a lot more concentrated of an area that and food source that they're eating but what's to say that they're not going to feed off of the same piece of clover from a food plot or the same corn because they'll group up and it's doing the same exact thing or if so, a rock scrape a lemon branch or a real scrape yeah branch. exactly you could do it's, these other weird things so i agree i i think baiting would help push more hunters into it might even incentivize people to shoot more does because they're coming into that bait pile that's right on you and you know, it, it does kind of make hunting a little right. more fun to just see more deer. Come I know I'm a probate guy. Um, yeah. And then as far as Michigan being a two buck and a million doe state, you can <laughs> shoot whatever you want pretty much. The seasons, rifle season now is from the 15th all the way to December 10th. Yeah. Because muzzleloader, you can use a rifle. And so I'm a fan of the, I'm a fan of Wisconsin's. They're one buck with a bow, one buck with a gun. Yeah. I think that is a fun thing to do. Yep. I could see, I know people don't want that one buck <clears throat> because of whatever reasons they want to shoot what they can. Yep. They can, they can do what they want there, but, <clears throat> excuse me, I think, I think one buck with a bow, then one buck with a gun would be a great starting point for Michigan. And I think it'd be, it would, make you wait a little bit more. Yeah. How many guys do you know that? You see it all the time on the Facebook post. You see, I hear guys like, oh, I shot this 130 inch eight point, it's beautiful. And then a uh, 90 inch six point, seven point comes out behind it. And they're like, oh, I'm tagged out for the year. Yep. And they saw 40 dollars two yeah. bucks. And it's yep. like, why well, shoot the two and a half year old 100 inch deer? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying don't shoot the two and a half year old. If it makes you happy and it gets you excited, 100%. shoot it. But there's no point in shooting too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like what really kind of sets us apart from Ohio, Illinois, Iowa, like all these Kansas, states that yeah. yeah, all these states that are known for these giant whitetails is that once people I feel like a lot of people that I know, like even family friends, they don't even hunt early season because as soon as rifle season starts, I know I can fill two tags, two buck tags, right. within you know a day or two of each other, just by sitting over a large like uh, crop field, mm -hmm. and they and just like that, like two two bucks, you know, however big they are, however small, are gone, right. and then no one hunts early season. So I think that actually making or not, you're not making anyone do it. You're it's their choice whether they want to give up that early season tag, that buck tag, you know, um, and then only taking that one during, um, during bow. But I feel like, at least for Michigan hunters, I feel like for a lot of, a lot of people, the first tag is kind of whatever comes out, you know, buck wise. And then the second one, you could be a little more picky on because it's your last one. So, so Michigan, they, Michigan's tags are, yeah. Your big buck tag is four more on one side, and then your any buck tag is any buck over three inch. It could be a spike all the way up to whatever. And I know I like it. Everybody else I know is like it. If you shoot a seven point and it's got four on one side, you're going to put your big buck tag on it because you're going to keep that small buck tag in your pocket just in case it gets late and you want to you shoot something. Yeah, and exactly. I... I, I see the APRs out there. There's every state does it a little bit different. I think two bucks is aggressive. Yep. And especially with the amount of crossbow hunters now, yeah, it makes archery season way more lethal. Yep. I know my dad's raven. My dad's a guy that uses a crossbow, and I think people should be able to use crossbows. But there's a lot more deer getting taken during archery season. Yep. And maybe the numbers don't say that, but in my mind, I know a lot of people that use crossbows that can be deadly with 
I just had to deal with the crossbow, and it's fun. You, it's like having a gun in your hand. You know, you're. Yeah, it pretty much is. Yeah, it's like a shotgun. Yeah, you shoot you're fifty yards out. Something like a raven like that, those can shoot. You know, up, up to hundred yards, no problem. But I agree. I think I think something needs to be done. How aggressive they take it, you know, that's something that's up in the air. But doing a one buck for doe season, a one buck for rifle, I think is a great place to start. And I, I think at that point, you might as well, you could keep the tag system the same way as one that's four on one side and the, the restriction and the other one that's three, but I don't I don't know why they don't just make them both four on one side. It's just gonna help everybody, even down to the, the youth kids shoot, shoot bigger deer. It's gonna help everybody that's hunted for 30, 40 years shoot bigger deer. And it's gonna help people like us that have you know been hunting since we can remember shoot more quality deer and uh you know allow them to live a bit a little bit longer get a little bit more mature if they wanted to be real aggressive which honestly i'd kind of be a fan of is to just be a one buck state and you know that's up in the air i know uh pennsylvania used to be a two buck state and they switched over to a one and some of the people in that are, you know are kind of bummed out because if they have a shooter come in they'll shoot that the bigger buck comes out can't shoot it so i i understand that too but overall i think it's just going to help the the hunter experience to to do that i wouldn't mind if they went over to that but i think just the push of people to shoot more does around here as a, as a venison source is going to be you know that has to kind of come into play a bit because I was reading an article in Iowa, Kansas, and I th it was Illinois or Missouri. They all, it's like a 1.6 does to buck that's shot each year. Maybe it's over two. I can't remember exactly. It's something, something in there, but it's a lot more does to bucks that are shot in a ratio. Michigan is like 0.5 does shot to each buck. So right there, you're already sourcing the issue. It, it, We've been at a standstill that when we see a nice buck come onto camera, we're talking 120, 130 inch buck. You yeah. know, you've had a couple bigger deer over on your side on the east end with them being urban and, you know, allowing to live a bit longer. But here, every single deer that's on this wall from this property is under 120 inches. Yeah. And they're, they're respectable bucks, but we. It's a bunch of two and a half, three and a half. We have been on that set list that it's like shoot the two most mature deer each year that we can and that's what we get you know so something needs to change of of doing it it's kind of made michigan be at a standstill and yeah i don't i don't necessarily know what that move is but i'm a big fan of doing something trying to trying out the one buck in a in the bow season one buck in rifle or just switching it to a one buck state and seeing how it goes because the worst that can happen is to change it elsewhere in a few years. So I think I think something needs to happen there. Yeah, and I I will say I see more of a push. I hear maybe it's social media. You just hear about it more. You didn't interact with those people before, but I think more people are practicing like QDMs, body deer management, and there's more people out there that aren't shooting the two and a half year olds, aren't shooting even the one and a half year olds, like there's more people that wanting to shoot bigger deer. Yeah. And like I said, I don't know if it's social media or what, but I know like growing up, you were just excited you you were just excited to shoot something. Yeah. And my dad, my grandpa, we my whole family, we were just I mean it's like it was exciting to shoot a buck, it didn't matter if it was a four point or six point and there was a push I read some article about it was pushed way back in the day to help increase the deer herd to not shoot does because the breeding does. It's kind of like ice fishing, you let go of the big females yep. so they can go breed. True. And so I think that, that there's a generation out there that got preached to not shooting does because I still, I know quite a few guys who don't like to shoot does. Yeah. Who they'd rather shoot two bucks, whether it's a one and a half and two year old, year old buck, than shoot a doe because for whatever reason, they're just, they don't like to shoot does. Yeah. And I love shooting does. Oh yeah, it's a great time. I love shooting deer. I like shooting does. I, and there's people out there that say they, when they're hunting state land or whatever, 
prepared to shoot whatever they can see because they don't see that many deer. I see way more does than I see bucks on the state line. Yeah. And I think that it's a pretty, pretty easy cop out to say I'm gonna shoot the first thing that walks out. Because yes. if, if you, and if they're not seeing deer, back to our first point, bring out the baiting. Yeah. They can shoot no over bait bow. Yeah. And for the people who say hunting over bait style hunting, don't hunt over bait them. Yeah. You don't have to. Yeah. You don't have to. You don't have to. You know, exactly what. All right. So another thing I want to touch on, because I guess not really for me and Dylan, um, more applies to you, like, because you have your own, your family has like your own farm that you guys have kind of like cultivated into your like little honey paradise per se. Mm -hmm. What are three things um, that you guys have done? And I, we could all talk about it because we've all had uh, big bucks that we've shot. What are three things that you think that you can do or that you have done to grow big deer? You know, it kind of coincides with what we just said because it is, we've kind of been at a standstill here. Um, I don't think we've quite done enough to, to do that. And how we get there, I, I think it's gonna start with this, this particular property is a lot of doe management. Because the thing you, when you read about the number of does, how that affects the um, deer herd, is you'll get a, a lot of older does that will push off one and a half year old bucks from feed and from bedding areas. And if you can get that one and a half year old buck to hang around and make this place his home, that's your next four and a half year old bigger buck. So I think here, the first step is doe management because opening morning for for mike and i like this year rifle we saw i think 20 deer and two were bucks you know that's that's a problem yeah so that's a the nine dough, to one buck dough to buck ratio that's... yeah and we've you know i and it's been like that for years yeah i've shot i've shot two to four does a year um you know last year my dad shot two i shot two and Mike shot one. We shot five does last year, and it, it still didn't quite make a dent. How many bucks? Um, three. Scott's Mike's, and then that smaller buck. Yeah, three bucks. Yeah. So it was a little better last year, but um, you know, I think that's one of the places to start. Our food sources could be a little more versatile because they feed on alfalfa kind of browse throughout it, but it's not their main feeding source. The corn, it's kind of comes and goes. They'll prefer beans right after that first frost, which we haven't had out here in about five years. The corn they'll relate to a little bit and the food plots, I just haven't done enough with them. I think that, that I should, uh, as far as spread and line to get the pH levels right, maybe fencing them off or something. So their browsing that happens earlier doesn't deteriorate how well it actually grows and stuff so i think the food source is huge and yeah, he's got that big oak ridge over there as well yeah there's, we, there's the big oak ridge the which is good too but i think the third thing that i really haven't done enough of i tried to set out a couple this year but i think is putting more mock scrapes and stuff too that a buck will want to make this his territory and something to check um will be big but i think as far as growing bigger deer the food source needs to be big because to, to get more bone on the top of their head, they need to have a higher protein content. So if we can push that in a food plot, great. But the other thing is to have more bucks feel comfortable around here, we got to get that dough number down. So it's kind of what we've been processing for the last few years. And I think we just need to push harder at it. So I'd say that's probably my biggest thing with it that, that we need to do here. Yeah, definitely, for sure. Don't, I mean, I just remember my first time coming out to the farm. Uh, I had never seen so many deer before in a food plot. We were turkey hunting, and I was like, Jake, there's 40 deer, 40 does yeah. in the field in front of us. Like, they just all funneled out. I'm like, you know, from southeast Michigan, I'm used to seeing like maybe one or two, maybe two to three deer usually does we've hunted woods our whole life. yeah we've hunted woods we've never i've never ever hunted over fields. um fields you know and when i saw all these deer i'm like dude this is crazy like 
look how many deer there are. And then I started noticing, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize it was an issue until, you know, Jake's like, yeah, I saw, you know, 60 deer and two of them were, you know, six points or above. And the rest of them were either does or spikes. Yeah. Uh, but I think for me, the three things, I think the biggest one, the most important one is having neighbors that yeah. are on the same page as you because you could do everything else right. You could be hand feeding this, you know, nice two year old buck and he walks over to the neighbors that you're, you know, you're gonna let this buck grow. He walks over the, past uh, the neighbor's line and gets shot right off the rip. And you know, he, so much potential just immediately gone. Um, so on the same page with your neighbors. We've had that issue here though too. I yeah. Know, Scott sits out there and we'll see all these, you know, really nice potential two and a half year old eight pointers that he's passed on for a long time. And we've had five this year. There's five really nice young eights and a couple of them that could have potentially been shooters that we passed. And he saw two of them cross the property line this year and get shot. So we've had that issue. That's a really good point too. And that's a good point for here. So yeah, I think, I mean, like I said, you could do everything right. Yeah. And then the deer just crosses the wrong property line and yeah. and there he goes. Um, I think having bedding, like sufficient cover yeah. for these deer to feel safe on your property and kind of like a sanctuary area, not just I mean, if you have thick cover and you're walking through it, it's no longer cover for these deer because you're, you're, you know, invading their, their space. So I like to have like a nice spot where I can just kind of block off, you know, this is where they bed down. I'm not gonna, you know, push real deep into it. Um, and then obviously a food source, food, yep. water source at this property by my house that we just, uh, that just got sold. We had like this nice creek that kind of pulled up a little bit, um, super slow. So we had a bunch of deer that would come, you know, it was like their little watering hole. We we put in a food plot ourselves. It wasn't very big, but you know, the deer would frequent it almost daily. And then we had um, super thick cover. Yeah. And we really didn't have, it was just our one other um, set of neighbors that hunted uh, close to us. And so uh, we were on the same page and that's how we got so many big deer. I think like our smallest deer was my dad's that he shot this year and was like maybe 110. Eight point, yeah. yeah, eight point. But the rest of them have been like over 120, um, which is kind of crazy to think about because we're only hunting 12 acres. No. Um, and as far as like the heavy bedding stuff, that's one thing that I would like to do out here as well as do some hinge cutting and stuff and really target an area that they're going to bed. So I kind of have a better peg on getting between their bedding and um, where they get to because they, they kind of swap beds out here. So and you could almost, really and then when you do that intentionally, you could almost be like, all right, the deer, I made a bedding, you know, source here. Right. This is where the deer are gonna bed. I can now make a trail or I could hang a set, you know, if they're gonna bet here, I could hang a set here and then proactively plan. Yeah. And ideally, you know, you could you could set up that betting to where they're gonna wanna bet here on a west wind and then you set your set for that too. So yeah, that's a good point. What about you, Dave? What do you think? Three, three so good things. The property that we had, we, we didn't grow big deer, it was 30 acres and it was a fantastic rut cruising spot. And some of the mistakes we made out there early that I think we learned from was to stay out of it. And mm -hmm. so we all love hunting and we just want to hunt. Yep. And <clears throat> there's been times out here, there was times there, there was times in Ohio where say you take time off or the weather, it's a cold front or whatever you have, whatever you have, right. you want to go hunting. And you know in the back of your mind, all right, I probably shouldn't go here, but you want to go hunt, so yeah. you go hunt it. And then you blow out some deer and you're like, ah, you don't think much of it. But I think down in Ohio, something that I learned quite quick was they were, they had some daylight pictures of some bucks and we got blown at quite a bit. And I, don't, I had never seen a big buck. All those bucks turned nocturnal pretty quick. You know? 
and I've seen it at the property that we used to have where we'd go in there and he might mess it up and a big buck will he'll he knows he's, yeah. he's old for a reason yep. and so one of the big things is just it's generic but hunt the wind and sometimes the best thing you can do is just not hunt yeah and say like that property was not good the first couple of weeks of october but you get we did food plots you did all this stuff and you're so excited to hunt that you go out there mm -hmm. in the mornings and for for me i know for you mornings early to mid october i'll blow more deer out than i'll see you yep. and so i think one of the best things you can do is hunt less yeah run your cell cams run do, do what you can still have fun but it's that it's that fine line of hunting for that trophy and hunting for fun and mm -hmm. so i think staying out of it is a big thing one thing we used to think was we had a bunch of goofy bucks yeah that had like two on this side five on this side and we're like oh we have to call that buck out because it's genetics or whatever yeah dude. and there's a lot of studies out there that show that that's as far from the truth as possible yeah you a, I was telling you about that one study where yeah, and I, antler I, the size is like 30% hereditary or something like that from the buck. The doe has more to do with how big the buck will be than the actual yep. buck will be. And they did all these studies. There's a million studies out there that show that you can't control Genetics. the antler size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, what you can do, if you want bigger deer, you need good habitat. Yep. And so that's good food, that's good water, it's good bedding. It's what you guys have been talking about, and that's why we're doing the doe management out here, is because, like you said, the more a buck eats when its antlers are growing, the bigger they're going to be. Yep. And so, I think not shooting those call bucks, because it's kind of you get nobody shoots a call buck the first week of October. Yep. <laughs> like you shoot a call buck at the end of November because you want to shoot something, and mm -hmm. so I think just learning more about how to actually grow deer there's there's a million studies out there just do more research on it try to get more educated on it and not blow out your property even yeah. here i think this year we did a pretty good job of it i know last year we got aggressive a handful of yeah. at least once on that i can day. remember yeah. and did it affect or not who knows but i think just make your deer feel comfortable you're gonna have bad neighbors and if you can keep deer on your property you know better chance of, you're gonna lose a couple yes yeah. it's just gonna happen they're gonna get hit by a row hit by a car they're gonna die of natural causes someone else is gonna shoot up shoot someone could poach them all these fields around here you know i know people night hunt around here like just control what you can control yeah that's a good point yeah well i guess that kind of goes into the last topic of what are your guys' goals in the 2024 season I mean, what are your goals for, I mean, what you hope to do and kind of some things you want to change and uh, just the overall, I mean, what's what's our goal going into 2024 hunting season? Yeah, so I think I'll start, I I want to shoot, I want to shoot a decent buck off public. Okay. I, I, I don't have, know that. I don't have property to hunt. I, I you know, not really. And. We gotta do some scouting, dude. It's impossible to, it's not impossible to lease around here. We struck out leasing it's around hard. here. It's hard. It's really tough. And there's good public around here. I got the saddle and stuff now. I I just gotta devote the time to go do it. Yep. And I'm not expecting to shoot a 140 off it, but I think if I get a buck over 110 off state next year, oh, it would yeah. be sick. You're wild. And also, I travel a lot for work. And so I think I might try to Try to dabble in some out of state stuff a little bit more I'm down there. I, I did touch this year and didn't see much down in Ohio, but I think it'd be fun to shoot a deer out of state. Mm -hmm. Whether that be out of outfitter on state land. You yeah. know, I know we're, we like to take our yearly trip. We haven't figured out where we're going to go next year, but I think we got to shoot a decent buck out of state. We've been trying for yeah. a long time. That's a good, uh, that's a good point. But you. Uh, yeah, because you got a lot of changes. 2024, without, without yeah. These, so dude. it's, I'm kind of like starting fresh. Um, I'm hoping to get my hands on a couple, couple of leases. I know, uh, 
on the east side, hunting is definitely not as popular and there's a lot of people with land that, you know, never even thought of someone hunting it. Um, so the idea is kind of like totally foreign to them. Um, but they also that suburban. Yeah, it's, you guys are some good here. Yeah, there. you're some seed one kind of guy. Yeah, <laughs> uh, not quite people's Come backyards, on, but I wish. Um, but yeah, so I think um, you know that the idea of hunting being so foreign to these people also like opens the door to them being more susceptible susceptible to to allowing us uh to access their land and i think another advantage that i have is that you know we purely bow hunt me and my brother Mm -hmm. um purely bow hunt um and then but it's still hard like it's i mean i've gotten one maybe in in a yes from someone that we don't hunt uh their property anymore just because it's uh just mismanaged but yeah i think the first one would be getting uh a new property and then kind of like cultivating it to meet our needs and try to get a long-term lease because i think it really helps um by when you're asking permission to like say just for this year you know like is it all right if i hunt for this year I have a ball in October. Yeah, and then they see, you know, like, all right, it, nothing bad happened. You know, mm-hmm. this worked out. I got some venison out of it. Some meal. And then you could be, can I at least, you know, can I do the following year, the following year, and then can I make it a long-term agreement uh, and then get on paper? But, yeah, so that's going to be my, my goal. I hate confrontation, so it's, it's be a little awkward, but... <laughs> I got to do it if I want to hunt and I, I want to hunt. So, yeah. yeah, I think, I think my goal and, you know, Bill touched on it. We've tried to get a lease for the last two years pretty heavily and it just hasn't worked out. Uh, you know, people hunt their land around here and that's just fine. It's just people do a lot of hunting in this small town. So I think the pressure of trying to get a lease and that being like our, you know, saving grace is, is kind of off. Uh, I think as we're still going to try to get a lease or permission, but it's not as much of a pressing thing because I think it's just going to have to kind of come to us uh, eventually, um, just kind of through the grapevine. It's just going to be like, a, oh, you, you're looking for something to lease? I got something. Um, so I think taking off of that and putting more of my attention here is going to be a big deal i I think maybe doing some of that stuff like we've talked about with getting a more secluded bedding area and a really good habitat we've already talked about for food plots next year we're going to make some changes as far as you know really hitting the ph levels right making kind of a rotation between what we do as far as the the brassicas and, and the other types of um, forage that we choose, we're going to kind of make a rotation based on what time of the year it's going to be and even do some fencing off so then we can open it up a week before we're going to hunt it and before that it's going to be barely touched. You know, I think that's going to make a major difference. So, okay, this. <laughs> wild time to go. I, yeah, tried, to, I so. tried to hold it as long as I could. So I think my focus this year is going to be a lot more here it's going to be kind of what Dylan said is, is really limiting my time pushing out here though, too, because you have to play the wind right. And sometimes staying out is a better bet. So I think, I think my tactics just need to switch a little bit because every year there's a cup, one or two really nice shooters out here. And I've put a lot of time in the last three years to not, not have shot one. So, I think it's just going to, it's just going to be targeting here a lot more with, with the food sources. I'm going to hit the mock scrapes really hard and I'm going to hit them earlier too. A lot of guys will put them out in August and I just never would have thought of that. So I think doing those things, making it a better habitat and next year shooting those earlier too is what I want to do. I'd like to get a couple doe tags filled either in that early doe or in the first week of October. So. I really, it, I'm so overdue that I think next year my biggest goal is to shoot a buck out here with my bow. 
Yeah. Um, that's that's my biggest thing. But I'd also like to be with you when you shoot that one on state land too. So yeah, I, I think it's to take some summer stuff. I know for me, I'm fishing the summer. Yeah. I, I don't think about hunting until end of September to October. Yeah. And so I, I think if I want to be successful, is all it takes is time you put in, the better yeah. you'll be. And so I'll either do more stuff in the summer or tell you the same thing next year about this time. So mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. So I think that's kind of my goal. But going forward, we thought we'd be ice fishing here in the next couple of weeks, but it's not. It's not looking like it's gonna pan out that way for Michigan this year. And we don't have any ice right now. January doesn't look good for it. So we kind of, we're kind of at a standstill of going out and making content for that stuff. So I think heading forward, our content's gonna be, you know, maybe some recipe stuff, some tactic stuff. And we might get the boat out. And yeah, I think I think we are gonna get the boat out on Croton, see if we can crack some perch and walleye and stuff too. So I don't really I don't really know what to expect, but you know we're gonna try and bring the the footage along with us because it's it's a crazy deal. It's and a weird my, time right now. My busy time of the year too. So it's uh, yeah, it's gonna be tough. I would love to get out on the ice, but I just don't know how much is gonna happen this year. I think when I do my travels over to Wisconsin and up to northern Michigan, I might uh, might have to bring some ice fishing stuff with me, see if I can't find ice in other places. Yeah. I got a trip going out to Green Bay to catch whitefish. Maybe I'll bring some cameras along there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is fun to do, like shoot my doe the other night. It was fun to just step away from the, the film side of things and making that an important deal and going to it. So I don't know what to expect the next couple of weeks. We'll definitely try to make as much content as we can but you know i'm excited for the spring and doing some turkey hunting i think we're gonna get some out of state turkey hunting happening and some you know back here in michigan too and dill needs to shoot his first turkey i haven't shot a bird g you need to shoot another one <laughs> i need to shoot my goal this year for a turkey is a decap that's that's like the number one thing. I know. I'm so mad I didn't shoot that one with you. I really am. Uh, that was that was a such a perfect scenario. I could have done it ten times over on that bird. But uh, so I, you know, that's what I would like to do. But Melanie hasn't shot a turkey before, and she really wants to. And my brother's never shot a turkey before. So there's a lot of there's a lot of people we gotta get out get on and the board. Turkey tag. So I'm excited for that. But. I hope you guys uh, found this podcast informational, got to know us a little bit. I'm sure you know by now, but I'm Jake, this is Giuseppe, there's Dylan there. I'm sick, I normally don't sound like this. And uh, yeah, I guess I do now, since I've had a kid, I'm really sick, but. We're missing a couple, what I would call members of the Elevate Outdoors crew with, you know, your brother Anthony and, and my brother Mike, but as far as the core three that you're gonna see on the channel, we're here and, uh, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed the the conversation our little hunting recap and kind of answering some of the general questions that we get um, as far as it goes for hunting but we're definitely looking forward to 2024's hunting season and we'll take you guys along with that so we're gonna head out and see if we can't whack a doe or six tonight because we have six tags <laughs> and uh and it's new year's eve so we got one day to do it it's just captain happy new year's eve boys let's go shoot some does.